Welcome one and all to another episode of Space This Week, the weekly show in which we cover news on all the upcoming launches we have to look forward to, reflect on the most recent launch successes, and reflect on all the best historical spaceflight anniversaries that we can get ready to celebrate over the next seven days. If you enjoy this video and you want to see more like it, then remember to hit that subscribe button to never miss one of these episodes, which we post every Monday. Anyway, that's enough intro waffle. Let's get right on to our first segment, all the stuff that happened last week. Our first story from last week is China's successful launch of the Long March 11 rocket, which occurred on the 15th of September. What's interesting about this particular launch is that it didn't take place over land. Instead, the rocket was launched from the Debo 3 mobile launch platform from the Yellow Sea. The rocket was carrying a payload of nine Jilin-1 high-resolution Earth observation satellites into Earth orbit. This is China's second successful sea launch and, according to the South China Morning Post, we can expect to see China utilize aquatic launch platforms more and more often due to their lower cost and lower risk compared to launching from land. To facilitate this goal, construction of a maritime spaceport in Shangdong is currently underway. This new approach to safety of civilians is certainly welcomed, given China's track record of dropping spent stages frighteningly close to populated areas, including the recent Long March 4B launch, whose first stage ended up crashing in very close proximity to a school. Next up, we were hoping to cover last week's Starlink launch, but unfortunately, it didn't go ahead due to extreme weather conditions. When it eventually does fly, this will be the first Falcon 9 flight to reuse a fairing for the third time, so it should definitely be worth the wait once it finally takes to the skies. Despite the lack of much news for their Falcon 9, SpaceX have been making some good progress on their shiny steel Starship. Construction of the SN8, SN9 and SN10 prototypes are well underway, the aft aero cover is now securely attached to the side of the SN8, and SpaceX appear to have managed to mount fins to the beast as well. The SN8 will be the most impressive flight-capable Starship prototype that we've seen so far, exceeding the timid hops of the SN5 and 6 by soaring up to altitudes in the region of 60,000 feet in order to test the spacecraft during high-altitude flight. Meanwhile, the SN9 has had its common dome stacked on its midsection and it also has a skirt with some legs ready to go. The SN10 is still in the earliest stages of construction, but its common dome has now been sleeved, so hopefully it won't be too long before we get to see it tower over the Boca Chica complex as well. On a final note, the SN7.1 is still with us. This Starship prototype is not designed for flight, but is instead designed to test how well the fuel tank can hold up under pressure. Its predecessor, the SN7, achieved a pressure of 7.6 bar before it began to leak, but SpaceX hoped that the new SN7.1 can beat this record. There were plans to test it to destruction last week, but unfortunately, the test didn't go ahead. SpaceX have requested new road closures for today and tomorrow, the 21st and 22nd of September, so hopefully we won't have to wait too long to finally see the SN7.1 go pop. But for now, that's a wrap on what we saw last week, time to look ahead to the next seven days. But before we do that, if you're enjoying this video, then feel free to leave us a little like down below. It's just a little something you can help to keep my channel stay healthy in the shadow of the algorithm TM, but uh, only if you want to, of course. I don't know. I'm not great at this self-promo thing. Let's just move on to uh, covering all the launches that we have to look forward to for the next seven days. Our first launch this week is the highly anticipated flight of the mighty Delta IV Heavy. This was initially supposed to fly late August, but after a hairy last second abort, the mission was delayed. Luckily, we now have confirmation that a new launch attempt will take place on September the 26th. This will be the first launch of the United Launch Alliance's biggest rocket in just over two years, after the successful launch of the Parker Solar Probe in 2018. Unfortunately, we don't really know what the payload of this week's mission will be beyond it being a classified satellite for the National Reconnaissance Office, which oversees US spy satellite operations. Named the NROL-44, the satellite's exact design and purpose are unknown. Here at Space This Week, we're certainly keeping our fingers crossed that we'll get to see ULA's Behemoth take flight. 
Our next launch is the NG-14 resupply mission to the International Space Station, which will be launching from Launch Pad 0 at NASA's Wallops facility. The payload will be carried by an Antares 230 Plus rocket, with the payload itself being the ninth flight of the Northrop Gummins Enhanced Sized Cygnus Pressurized Cargo Module, and it's loaded with about 3,500 kilograms of research, hardware, and crew supplies. It'll stay at the ISS for about a month, and should re-enter the atmosphere in November. And that's all the launches that we have to look forward to over the upcoming week, but now let's take a look at all the historic spaceflight anniversaries that we can get ready to celebrate in space history this week. First up, on September the 21st, 2003, the Galileo spacecraft meets its fiery demise after being sent into Jupiter's atmosphere. It had a long old life, having been first delivered into space in 1989 aboard Space Shuttle Atlantis. Galileo's mission was to study Jupiter and its moons, and it ended up discovering evidence of a saltwater ocean beneath the icy surface of Europa, Jupiter's fourth largest moon, as well as finding extensive volcanic processes on the moon Io and a magnetic field generated by the moon Ganymede. Galileo didn't just provide great insight into the Jovian system, however. During its journey to our solar system's biggest tenant, the spacecraft became the first spacecraft to visit an asteroid. In fact, it visited two, Gaspar and Ida. It also provided the only direct observations of a comet colliding with a planet, and during one of its gravity assists by Venus in 1990, it took some fascinating infrared images of the planet's clouds. Which brings us back to this day in 2003 when, after 14 years in space and 8 years in the Jovian system, Galileo's mission was terminated by sending it into Jupiter's deadly atmosphere at over 48 kilometers per second, in order to ensure that it wouldn't collide with the Jovian moon and inadvertently contaminate it with terrestrial bacteria. A few days later, on September 24th in 2014, India's first interplanetary spacecraft, the Mars Orbiter mission, arrives at Mars after a 298-day transit from Earth. This mission made India the first Asian nation to reach Mars orbit and the first nation in the whole world to accomplish this goal in its first attempt. Another achievement for this mission was its surprising affordability, clocking in at a bargain US dollar equivalent of 73 million. This is the most affordable Mars mission to date. Its primary objective is to develop the technology required for designing, planning, managing and operating interplanetary spacecraft, but it also has the secondary objective to explore Mars's surface and analyze its morphology, mineralogy and its atmosphere using indigenous scientific instruments. The mission is still ongoing and it's being monitored by the Indian Space Research Organization. The next day, but back in 1992 this time, NASA launches the Mars Observer mission. The plucky spacecraft's objective was to study the Martian surface, atmosphere, climate and magnetic field. Tragically, however, the probe failed 11 months after launch, after communication with it was lost a mere three days before orbital insertion at Mars. Attempts to re-establish communication with the probe were unsuccessful, sealing the poor robot's fate to forever roam the stars in silence. In happier news though, on September 27th, 2003, we had the launch of a successful probe. The SMART-1 satellite was launched. Its name was an acronym for Small Missions for Advanced Research in Technology. Uh, one, <laughs> and was launched from the Guiana Space Center by the ESA aboard an Ariane 5G. Its role was to test solar electric propulsion and other deep space technologies and to validate a new set of miniaturized instruments aimed at lunar scientific investigations. The SMART-1 was ESA's first moon mission and was technically and scientifically a success and helped ensure Europe's technology competence in lunar exploration. The mission ended on 3rd of September in 2006, after the spacecraft was deliberately crashed into the moon's surface. Our final space anniversary this week is the launch of the Dawn spacecraft, which took to the skies on September 27th, 2007, aboard a Delta II launch vehicle. The Dawn was a mission of epic scale, having the mission to study two of the three known protoplanets of the asteroid belt, Vesta and Ceres, the two most massive bodies in the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. 
Unlike missions such as the Voyager program, which could only really fly past their targets, the Dawn spacecraft was equipped with a fancy new ion propulsion system, giving it enough Delta V to achieve orbit around both of its targets, the only spacecraft ever to have the ability to orbit two extraterrestrial destinations. It gave us extraordinary insight into the two bodies and gave us some incredible photographs as well. The mission was terminated in 2018 after the spacecraft depleted its fuel reserves and it remains in orbit of Ceres to this day. And that concludes all of the coolest spaceflight anniversaries that are set to take place over the next seven days. And with that, another episode of Space This Week must come to an end. I do hope you enjoyed today's episode, and if you would like to check out more, then you can find a link to the full playlist on the left-hand side of your screens. The right-hand panel is a video that YouTube thinks you'll like, so hopefully it made a good choice. Anyway, guys, I'm going to finish up there. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I will see you in the next one.